Hello everyone, welcome to Relationship Talk with Sharonda. My name is Sharonda Parker and I am your host. And today we're gonna to be talking about our third part of the communication series, toxic communication styles, okay? And I'm always grateful when I pray about a topic and God really gives me illustration to be able to show you exactly what it looks like, okay? Um, and I'm going to get off into um, giving you the rundown, but I just want to tell you what all of this is before we get started. This pink sheet of paper, it represents the marriage, right? The white salt shake is going to represent my bride. The black pepper is going to represent my groom okay and this is going to represent their marriage i'm eventually move these pieces of paper everything in the black is going to represent outside of the marriage so i just want you to understand that once i finish breaking this down i'm going to show you what toxic communication does to the marriage a lot of times we put a lot of emphasis on the wedding, y'all, but the wedding is really just one day. Sometimes I see people plan two and three years for a wedding one day. My concern is the marriage. God has called me to help with the marriage. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. I hope you all are having a wonderful day thus far. If you have not already liked this video, go ahead and like this video because I know it's going to bless you. I know it's going to open your eyes up. I have been getting so many emails and inboxes um, about this communication series. So this is the third video. If you have not watched the other two videos, please go back and watch those videos because they will bless you as well. But this one is going to be about toxic communication styles. And the reason I wanted to talk about this one is because this is what gets you to divorce court. A lot of people think that it's the infidelity. A lot of people think that it is, and I'm, and I'm not saying that those things don't matter. A lot of times people think that it's the finances and all of this, but let me tell you something. Communication can definitely get you in the courtroom toxic communication and see when i was when i was dating my husband my mom never really had an issue with my husband i'm gonna be honest with you her concern was always his family and what i didn't understand then is what i do understand now okay you have some people who were raised in love. And then you have some people who was raised on survival. And those are two totally different types of upbringing. I remember the very first time that I brought my husband, well, he was my boyfriend then, to one of my family functions. And it was Christmas Eve, and I invited him to come to Mommy's house for Christmas Eve. Mommy is my grandmother. I'm going to give you a little background, and I'm going to get into this uh, video. But Mommy was a middle-class woman, very very well educated, um, had a beautiful family, children, loads of grandchildren, and a lot of two-parent households, like, almost like the Huxtables, the, the American dream, what anybody would ask for, a living room with a fireplace, a Christmas tree decked out, um, you know, adults drinking eggnog, children sitting around, uh, one of the older cousins watched, what they reading the, um, a Chris, this Christmas story book. So when my husband, well, my then boyfriend walked in, of course, I introduced him to everybody in my family, right? And when he walked into the living room and he saw the Christmas tree, the fireplace lit, and one of my cousins was sitting down reading a story 
to the little babies, like the two and three year olds, and everybody was just sitting down Indian style, listening to her read the story. He looked at me and said, "Man, it's like some, it's like some shit you see on TV." I kid you not. That's that. That was how he responded. This look like some shit you see on TV, right? That's my family. That's my upbringing. So we leaves my family and we go to his family. Completely different scenery. Fighting, drinking, chaos, police, just something that I had never seen before, never experienced before. Because this was my upbringing, but this was his upbringing. And the issue that my mama had was the family. Today, I understand why that was so important because a lot of people don't grow up in love. They grow up on survival. And when I tell you that because I've been married 22 years now. If I'm going to be honest and I'm going to be transparent, we had a lot of growing pains. Okay? When I say on-the-job training, it was really on-the-job training for both of us. We knew we loved each other, but we were so different. Okay? And let me tell you something. When you're trying to talk to people and you are met with aggression, you are met with uh, somebody being argumentative, you are, you are met with just hateful type of behavior. Sometimes you don't even know what to do with it, but this is all that this person know because they have been raised to be combative. So a lot of times it's not about solutions for some people. It's about being right for some people. But I was recently listening to I can't remember what I was listening to, but this made so much sense to me. And the person said, I will let you be right. I'll just be correct. And that was something that I really had to hold on to. Still holding on to. Because let me tell you something about what's about right. Right is subjective to the person. Because what may seem like is right for you may not be what I consider to be right. Okay, so right is subjective. So my thing is, you know what? I'll let you be right. I'll be correct. See, correct is completely different. Correct is factual. It has nothing to do with subjective. It has nothing to do with emotions. It has nothing to do with how I feel about it. It's about correct. It's about facts. It's not subjective. So when you're dealing with people who just have to be right, what my God tells me is what's the most important thing, especially when you marry, is pursuing peace. And when I met my husband, I communicated in love. And let me tell you something. Sometimes you have to really be mindful because you'll start picking up on bad behaviors trying to keep up in other words what I had to learn was if I was going to make it in the Parker family I was going to have to toughen up because they were a handful so I, I felt like I had to toughen up and what happened was over a period of time I started to change who I naturally was as a person, as a woman, trying to be able to deal with all that was going on. But it took me, because I went, I, I was married, but I didn't start building my spiritual relationship with God until I was almost 10 years into my marriage. Like, I'm going to be honest with you, the first 10 years, I probably went to church maybe five, six times in 10 years, meaning that I wasn't a person that was, in my 20s, I wasn't building a relationship with God. I didn't start building a relationship, a solid foundation with God until I got in my 30s. Okay? 
And when I started building that relationship with God, I started watching the transformation in me. So when people tell you train up a child in the way that they should go and when they get older, they will not depart from it. I went back to everything that I knew. I went back to all of my original teachings because I realized that all that stuff I had been picked up on, it wasn't doing me no earthly good. It wasn't getting me nowhere. And the only thing it was going to do was lead me to divorce court trying to keep up with how the Parkers at. So we're going to get into this live. Who you choose to spend the rest of your life with is going to be one of the most critical decisions that you could ever make in life. Relationships, they can be fulfilling. They can be meaningful. They can be rewarding. But they can also make you or break you. I'm reading my notes. <laughs> they can also make you or break you. So in other words, this thing can actually be good for you. It can nourish you. It can make you glow. It can do all of this kind of stuff. But guess what? The same thing, if you're not with the right person, it can tear you down. To the point where you could lose yourself. And you don't even know who you are anymore. And you don't even know how you got to this point anymore. A lot of times we base relationships on chemistry. Chemistry is just the beginning. Meaning chemistry is the attraction. And what happens is a lot of people get caught up in this romantic stage of chemistry. They get married based on chemistry. Everything, they, they end up getting pregnant based on chemistry. But what happens is chemistry is not going to sustain your relationship. Connection is what sustains your relationship. This bride and this groom, they are connected. They're connected. That's what made them say, you know what? We could do this thing. We could get married. We can live a happily ever after. We could do it because we connected. Right? But then comes toxic communication styles. Because see, in the beginning, a lot of times, we'll say what we got to say. And it's almost like, <laughs> you know, like lit. In other words, it ain't no deep serious conversations but if something happens after you get married in other words once you get married all of a sudden everything starts getting real now you together you married and one thing that starts to happen is criticism criticism and sometimes it's happening on both ends and instead of you being a person that handles issues in love, what happens is you become a critic. And I just want to let you know, criticism is what makes people feel hurt. It makes people feel rejected. In other words, it's like somebody taking something and just picking it apart. I've had that happen to me and I've even done it myself. So the thing is, I don't like to make it seem like this is only one-sided. It happens in marriage. And the thing about criticism is, it's a way to be factual. Because a lot of times when we, we talk about criticism, sometimes we are being honest. Sometimes we have to say that, you know what? You're not handling business. You're not being responsible. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. But the thing about criticism is it can be done in love. And the one thing that I always tell people, if you're going to tell somebody one wrong, you got to tell them seven rights. If you can't tell them seven things they did right, then you don't talk about the one thing they did wrong. And I'm saying this because you can talk about the wrong, but you got to let people know that they're doing something right sometimes too. Because if you don't, what happens is all it looks like you're doing is picking them apart, just being critiquing them, just tearing them down. So you got to tell people that they're doing something right. Some of the times you got to affirm them in some type of way. In other words, you can't just be stripping them and stripping them and stripping them and picking them apart. 
So let's talk criticism. Creates the division. We got a lit. We got a lit division. We got a lit division. Criticism is one of the beginning things that starts to draw the wedge between two people. So we got the criticism. We're going to separate them just a little bit. It's, it's the criticism, meaning that it's the tit for tat. You ain't did this. You ain't do that. Well, why you did this that way? And why you did this that way? And you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. And you said, and you didn't, and you didn't keep your word. And you was late and you didn't make me. And the thing is, if you hear that all the time, it almost seems as though everything that I'm doing right is never being acknowledged. And the only thing that you can communicate about is what you feel like I'm doing wrong. That's not healthy. And the only thing that does is creates division. The next thing we have is something called contempt. Contempt is this little passive aggressive type of stuff. Like smart eloquently remarks. In other words, y'all to resolve the issue supposedly and y'all done went on with your life supposedly and then the bride might say to the groom or the, the the wife might say to the husband baby i love you i love you baby and he'll say something like today do you know that that hurts because she looking for you to say i love you too she looking for you to say, I love you too. I miss you too. Come hug me, come kiss me too. She looking for that. But what she got was today. As if, yeah, you love me today, but uh, on the other day when we was arguing, it wasn't no love. But let me explain something to you because I have to tell this to my husband all the time. Just because we haven't, a disagreement has nothing to do with the way I love you because love is action. You don't have to always be in, agreeing, in agreement with somebody for them to feel like you love, that, that they're loved. In other words, love is a knowing. Love knows that regardless of what, I'm coming. If you need me, I'm here. That's what love is. What happens when you got critic? No, what is it? Contempt. Because I got my notes. What happens when you got contempt is another little wedge apart. Because it's like, okay, we said we had to say. I thought we had made up. Trying to move forward in life and continue on with our day but you won't even allow me to move forward. That means that obviously you still holding on. And let me tell you something that I had to learn when I was dealing with, well, with my husband, seriously, him, because not so much the Parkers, but he hold grudges. He hold grudges. The Parkers, they hold grudges. In other words, it's something that they do within their family. They hold grudges. See, this is stuff that my mama was telling me about. She was trying to let me know, you ain't even ready for this here, baby. You going over there, <laughs> but you ain't ready for it. And I'm the type of person, I'm a very forgiving person. I'm a very compassionate person. You can literally wrong me in a certain type of way, and I can still forgive you and not hold you to it. In other words, not bring it up every time I'm upset with you that you did this, 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 that, the other to me. In other words, I know how to forgive and I know how to move forward. But it's hard when you're dealing with people who hold grudges. Okay? And a lot of a lot of contempt is these people still harboring this stuff in their heart. In other words, they ain't really forgave you and they ain't let it go like they said that they did. That's, that's really what contempt is. It's still up. So as you can see, our bride and groom getting further and further apart from each other. 
The next is defensiveness. Now, let me just say something about defensiveness because a lot of times when a person is telling you something and you jump to the defense, it's only natural for you to try to defend yourself. Meaning, it, and it, it's something that you just do. Quite naturally, if somebody is saying something, you're trying to explain to them why. And it's not sometimes that you make an excuse. It's sometimes you're really trying to explain to them why you did what you did. But when you're dealing with somebody or people or whatever who have this black and white, when they're dealing with life, a lot of times they don't understand that there's some gray areas. So it's not that you're not trying to be accountable. It's just that you're trying to explain. Well, that's one thing, but it comes off as defensiveness, meaning that Every time I try to correct you and tell you right, you coming back with a rebuttal saying I did this, but I did this because and to a certain extent, it can be uh, something that is damaging if the person never holds themselves accountable. Now, the thing is, if you bring it to the person, they try to explain themselves, but then they still hold themselves accountable and say, you know what? You are right. I could have done this this way. The next time. If this ever happens, this is how I will handle it. You gotta, either you're gonna forgive or you're not gonna forgive. But again, when you're dealing with people who hold grudges, a lot of times they will listen to your solution, but still hold you to what you did. Even if you, if you have shown that you have learned from the mistake, they will still hold you to what you did. And months down the road, you will still hear about what you did. And this does what? Creates a bigger division. The last thing that I'm going to talk about, which is the most damaging type of toxic communication pattern, and it is called stonewalling. This is when both people have literally, or one person has literally checked out of the marriage mentally, meaning that they're not talking, they're not communicating, all of the things that they said that they would do, all of the things. In other words, you say, well, when we get into an argument, we're going to get it resolved by the end of the night. We're not going to be angry all of a sudden. That's not happening anymore. Okay, well, we're going to agree that, you know, if we get into an argument, you know, we're not sleeping on the couch. All of a sudden, another person like to hell with that. I'm sleeping on the couch. To hell with all these rules we put in place. I'm sleeping on the couch. Well, when we go somewhere, we're going to let each other know where we're going. So, you know, that we can make sure that we're safe. Now, all of a sudden, this person get in their car and they just going and ain't saying where they at, where they doing. In other words, they just literally doing them. This is the most damaging thing. And it falls under the communication because that means there is no communication. This person is literally physically there in the household, physically there, in the marriage, but mentally completely checked out. And what happens is one person starts noticing that, you know what, this person ain't even trying no more. They ain't even trying. So what you think the other person going to do? They got options now. They could either press and pray their way. And pray that it begins restored. But let me tell you something about restoration. It takes two people for restoration to happen. If you got one person who just don't want it, they done checked out, baby, you could do all the fasting and praying and pressing that you want to do. What you got to do is ask God to loose you because the person got to want it just like you. And when a person don't want it no more, you have to accept that they don't want it no more. So when it gets to this point where they are literally stonewalling and they are mentally checked out and they're not doing anything that they said that they would do and they have literally just disregarded all of the boundaries and everything that you put in place, this person has checked out of the marriage. Eventually, this person, they might still be in it. But it's only so much rejection you're going to take. It's only so much neglect you're going to take. 
It's only so much lying and not be holding each other accountable. And I, it's only so much you're going to take because you are human. And even though the paperwork ain't been done for some separation or divorce or anything like that, this person going to check out of the marriage too. This is what toxic communication does. This is what it looks like. Right here. This is what it looks like. Two people who was once joined together because they did not know how to communicate effectively. They're both outside of their marriage instead of being inside of their marriage. It takes two people to want to make this thing work. It takes two people to come to the table like adults and say, you know what? We really need to talk about this and get this resolved and come to some type of solution, whether we're going to agree to disagree or, you know, whether we're going to come up and put a plan in place or whatever it is. It takes adults to do that. And a lot of times we have so much pride caught up in ourselves to neither one of us will say, look, come back to the marriage. Come back to the marriage so we can talk about it. What happens sometimes is one person will come back to the marriage and the other person will be on the outside talking about, well, let me see what you're going to do. And when you do what you're supposed to do, then I, I might step back in. It don't work like that, baby. Both people got to come in giving 100%. And if both people ain't coming in giving 100%, it's not going to work. You might as well go ahead and make arrangements to be going y'all separate directions. Get y'all lawyers, do your paperwork, and go ahead and res uh, and and go ahead and dissolve the marriage. That way, you can go ahead and live your life however you choose to live it. Because what happens is when it look like this here, this is misery. This is misery. Meaning one person in it and trying, and the other person out there doing what they want to do. I reverse it. The man in there trying, and she out there doing what she want to do. However it is, it's still miserable because nobody gets married with the intentions on wanting to get divorced. But with this type of toxic communication, the only thing that will, it, the only thing it will do is land you in divorce court. That's it. So what we have to do is we have to learn how to communicate in love. We have to learn that we can't just be angry all the time. We have to learn that we have to communicate like the other person on the other end got feelings too. Yeah, both people, they got feelings too. And just because you are the head does not mean that you get to make your wife a doormat. Or ladies, just because you are the breadwinner does not mean that you get to push your husband around. So this thing goes both ways. I hope this video blessed you. Um, I need you to like, share, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Um, I just really want couples to be better. I just that that is my passion. For I've been in this adult interest for a long time. And I've always had a passion to deal with married people. And for a long time, this was before, you know, I knew about YouTube and being able to get the message out to people. For a long time, I would ask people, you know, what you think about me coming to talk to the married ladies at your church? Oh, no, I don't think they would want you to come to the church because, you know, you sell toys and you, you do this kind of stuff. But one thing that God showed me was he will... Force his way into any industry, even the adult industry. And I just thank God that he's using me as a vessel, even though I'm in the adult industry. That he's able to be a part of the industry through me. And he's able to actually come into people's homes and get the, and, and they can get this knowledge through me, him operating through me. I want to give a shout out to my pastor, Dr. Bridget Stive. And the reason why I want to give her a shout out is because she always teaches through illustration. And I never consider myself to be a teacher or any, like I'm talking about 
sp biblical spiritual teacher. But I thank God for giving me the gift that he has given me. And I thank him for giving me illustration so that it can become real to people. Because a lot of times she teaches through illustration and it, it becomes very real. So I know when I'm in the audience and I see the illustration and I get it, I know when you on YouTube and you see the illustration, you get it. Okay? You all be blessed. You all enjoy your day. Like, share, and subscribe. Um, if this video blessed you, send a tip to the cash app. Be blessed.